Hello, good evening all. Okay, ma'am, we're good to start. Chala. Yeah, my video is not okay. starting. So yeah. Mega Mika, the co-host. I will only start or you're going to do now? I will start and then I'll introduce you. Yeah. Okay, better. Thanks. Mega, let's go live. Let's start. Started, ma'am. We are live. Yes, and it's live also. Good afternoon, everyone. Heartiest welcome to the fifth Ocean Maha, the National Nutrition Month 2022. I welcome you all from Indian Dietetic Association Mumbai chapter and Hatsa to a webinar on spectrum of malnutrition, prevention, and management. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to another thought-provoking webinar, which will lead us towards a Suposhit Bharat. Collectively, between today and tomorrow, we have over 100 decades of experience. I'm not always over-exaggerating. We do have a lot of senior faculty members who, who will be joining us here, and they'll be addressing this August gathering, a bit virtual, in, with a lot of their experiences in the field, in the community, and this probably will pave the path for a Suposhit Bharat. India, as you know, had over the last 45 years had various nutrition programs such as ICDS, the Midday Meal Program, the National Food Security Act of 2013. Five years ago, we started with Poshan Mahar and Poshan Abhiyan, the Anganwadi Service Scheme, the Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana. Yet, there are a lot of roadblocks which still you know, keeps our country in the undernourished and stunting still persist around different parts of India. Why is it we are still here? It, it, it acts as a major roadblock in the economic progress of our country. At one hand, we are the global so, so economic power. On the other hand, we are still fighting with malnutrition and mal malnutrition in different forms in a, a locality like uh, an urban area as well, we do see malnutrition in the affluent populations as well. So here we are to discuss about different community related malnutrition aspects. Before we begin with this webinar, let me take this opportunity to start on an auspicious note. Let us all join in lighting the lamp. Mega, can we have that slide please? There's a very popular shloka which says, Shubham Karoti Kalyanam Arogyam Dhana Sampada. Let us light this lamp and move towards, Mega, you can start. Let us light this lamp and move towards enlightenment. Let us move towards a Suposhit Bharat. Let this light be symbolic to paving the pathway to the progress that we're trying to make in the field of nutrition trying to reach every masses, trying to reach every smallest possible locality in India. With this, I take this opportunity to welcome our convener, Ms. Zamrut Patel. Can we have the slide for ma'am, please? Ma'am is the chief dietitian of Global Hospital in Pareri and she has immense experience in the field of renal nutrition. She specializes in different kinds of renal conditions. She has published various papers. And at the moment, she's the convener of Indian Dietetic Association Mumbai chapter. Over to you, ma'am, for the welcome address for National Nutrition Month. So thank you very much, Sukhda. Indeed, uh, on behalf of the Indian Dietetic Association Mumbai chapter, I welcome you all to this program in the Nutrition Month, National Nutrition Month. We are uh, happy to partner with Hatsa and do this webinar. As uh, Sukta has already highlighted, 
the importance of this month and the theme for this month which which is focusing on maternal and child nutrition basically conservation of water and of course uh, talking of the regional foods you know eat local and be uh, getting more nutrients is what this month's theme emphasizes and today we are here to talk to you on a topic which is very important we are not only talking to you because it is this problem of uh, malnutrition in, is in the rural areas but in urban areas also we see this uh, problem and that is why today we have eminent speakers who will be discussing this in depth so not taking more time let's move uh, on with the seminar but uh, before we go ahead let us have our hatsa partner can i have the slide sukda please for the hatsa uh, senior committee member yes ma'am mr vishwajit he is there with us yes ma'am yeah so he is a very senior faculty and uh, he is a, a senior member from the hatsa team and he has uh, done a lot of work when it comes to parental nutrition he has been with uh, fresenia scabi in various capacities in the past and presently also he is attached with uh, fresenia scabi so welcome uh, and over to you mr vishwajit he is there with us right yes ma'am yeah so over to him please sukda thank you he has lost connection uh give us a second yeah we'll just check mr kaushik do you want to address the crowd we'll just wait for the minute wait for a minute yeah, yeah. we okay. can come back yeah, meanwhile sure. dipesh can you just talk to him otherwise i will take over sure okay all right yeah jambru then sukda and all okay okay all, uh i think vishwajit is uh, so he is having yeah connection. network issues yeah okay. he has lost his connection so okay so we can this. yeah i will take over yeah please do you want to start your camera mr if, if he joins if he joins in between sure. then we'll see sure. otherwise sure. i will tell him to speak few words if he joins maybe in between sure the, sure sir otherwise sir, i'll just formally welcome hmm? yes yes please okay. take over thank you thank you thank you so once again a very good evening to all on behalf of health foods and dietary supplements association this more known as harsa and idea mumbai chapter a warm welcome to all the participants from harsa idea academia speakers and the leadership team of idea mumbai chapter in today's interesting webinar centering on the theme spectrum of malnutrition prevention and management on behalf of the organizing committee of both harsa and idea mumbai chapter it's indeed a pleasure for me to welcome you all to this important webinar this activity has been organized as part of national nutrition month harsa and mumbai idea mumbai chapter has been collaborating in value added activities of interest to nutraceutical professionals and nutritionists i am happy to note that in today's webinar we also have a recipe making competition among students i think we have a vishwajit uh, back with us i will uh, request him to take over vishwajit thank you so much mr kaushik uh, over to you dr karandeka vishwajit you are on mute we'll have to make him a co-host mega he's already there otherwise he won't be there on this co-host yes he's there i'm audible yes vishwajit you are audible yeah So once again, a very good evening to all of you on behalf of the Health Foods and Dietary Supplements Association, HRSA, and IDA Mumbai Chapter. A warm welcome to all the participants from HRSA, IDA Academia, speakers, and the leadership team of IDA Mumbai Chapter in today's interesting webinar 
studying on the theme spectrum of malnutrition prevention and management on behalf of the organizing committee of both head and ida mumbai chapter it's still a pleasure for me to welcome you all to this important webinar this actually has been organized as part of national nutrition month hadsa and ida mumbai chapter have been collaborating in value added activities of interest to nutritional professionals and nutritionists i am happy to note that in addition to this webinar we also had a recipe making competition among the we have experts from both from industry and nutrition sector share their knowledge on challenges Vishwajit, you are audible. Question is, your program is. Mr. Vishwajit, we are able to hear. Sorry. We have also to keep in mind that nutrition is the right of the person and should not be deprived of his rights. Nutrition can be a lifestyle. Nutrition can be a lifestyle. Nutrition can be used for the proper growth of the individual. And hence, all the nutritionists and dietitians change their hats as per the need of the individual. There may be a few of you who are not much familiar with Halsa, so let me take this opportunity of briefing you all about the premier association of health foods and dietary supplements in India. Halsa is the apex not-for-profit association in India, voicing the nutritional, dietary supplements and ingredients industry, and is a corporate member of the internet. Alliance of Dietary Supplement Association, based out of UK. <clears throat> Natural Vision is to provide science through healthy, safe, and quality of products, and to develop and guide the nutraceutical and food industry, academia as well as support government initiatives. We work very closely with FSSI on several of their policy initiatives. Apart from other objectives, one of the main objectives of HAFSA. is to share knowledge and educate all stakeholders today's event is a fulfillment of the same we have special membership fees for idea members and already few members have been have taken the benefit you can approach your secretarial uh, members and also to your committee members who will assist you in becoming member of the vibrant association i am sure that presentation and panel discussion by the distinguished speakers will be highly enlightening for providing thank you all for joining and wishing you a very great knowledge sharing for the same thank you so over to idea thank you so much mr karandikar dr karandikar we now move on to our uh, next talk anaga over to you good evening everyone malnutrition or combating malnutrition has always remained the core theme of national nutrition month or poshan maah for years malnutrition is often synonymously used with undernutrition or deficit of calorie protein or hidden hunger but according to who and we will also agree that over the years india is facing a dual burden of malnutrition where there is coexistence of undernutrition along with existence of obesity or overweight presence of diet related uh, Uh, non-communicable diseases in an individual household and population at every stage of life so it's not a certain group which is which could be dealing with malnutrition it can be a range of age groups which deal with it in a lancet study which was published in 2020 globally 2.28 billion or more children and adult are overweight and more than 150 million children are stunted non-communicable disease contribute to around 38 million global deaths globally and 5.87 million deaths in india every year keeping this in mind as dietitians we play an essential role in creating awareness conducting nutrition education programs and nutrition intervention to optimize nutrition requirement at community level across income groups and across different age groups to prevent and deal with malnutrition our first talk today deals with a similar theme and to address the same we are extremely fortunate to have none other than dr anuradha mitra ma'am who has experience in community nutrition as well as icds for more than 3 decades i welcome anuradha mitra ma'am she is an ex hod department of food nutrition and dietetics college of home science jamna niketan university of mumbai she has over 36 years of ug and pg teaching experience she has been a research guide for msc students worked with icds since 1988 and been their advisor 
on THR cooked meals training of Anganwadi workers, and she's got special interest in community nutrition and food science. Ma'am, I welcome you to uh, start your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anaga, for that uh, nice, uh, very uh, good in introduction that you gave. Yes, I do have a lot of interest in community nutrition. And that has been uh, almost my next passion after teaching. So uh, I would like to, without wasting much time, uh, first of all, thank the organizers, that is IDA and Hatsa as well as all the members of IDA and the panelists, my other co-speakers uh, and the participants, of course, those who are watching this, uh, attending this webinar. So without wasting much time, I would like to start on with what I want to share today. Okay, so I will try uh, screen sharing. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you all see my uh, screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes. Okay. Fine. So I was asked to basically talk about optimizing nutrition for children in community, uh, practical perspective. Now, before I begin my talk, I would just like to tell you that I uh, wanted to handle it in a little different way. Because as Anaga has rightly put it, that it is over the years that we have been talking about undernutrition and malnutrition. I remember as a student, I was taught about PCM, you know, protein calorie malnutrition. By the time I finished my uh, graduation, post-graduation and started teaching somewhere down the line, it became PEM, protein energy malnutrition. And by the time I'm uh, retired now today, uh, last uh, some years now, we have been calling the same thing as Sam, ma'am, and so on and so forth. So it got me thinking as like, it's like, are we putting uh, the old wine in new bottles each time? Or what is actually happening? Why is it that we are not able to shake off this malnutrition? And instead, we are adding more and more of different types of malnutrition. So I thought I will do a little you know, a flashback kind of a thing and then go ahead to the actual topic. So I'm handling it a little differently. I hope uh, you will all accept it and like it. Now, uh, to begin with, and also I want to clarify because the teacher in me has not retired. So over the years, I have realized that very often uh, students who are a very, very important part of webinars and of the learning, teaching learning process, very often uh, do refer to so many uh, you know, acronyms and so many standards that are there, but somehow probably do, do not uh, you know, have either the scope or probably the time or whatever it is to actually get into what it means and what it stands for. So I would like to brush up a little before we go on to the actual optimizing of nutrition. So I would like to place a few facts over here, facts regarding our country and other countries also to some extent. Now, as we know that one of the most malnourished developing nations in the world is our country. Though we have made strides and we have also got Mangalyan and so on and so forth, unfortunately, we still belong in this category. We often like to blame poverty, but it is not just poverty. There are n number of coexisting factors merged with poverty, which are responsible for malnutrition. When I use the word malnutrition, very often it may denote undernutrition, but more than not nowadays, currently, it will include both under and over. So the percentage of population which is suffering from various forms of malnutrition is much exceeding those people who are living below the poverty line. And that is something that we have to think. So it's not just money or poverty. Government has, of course, made large 
number of food security and anti poverty programs and so on but however there are gaps between what is on paper and what is actually existing and how it has been taken ahead women and girls are particularly marginalized disadvantaged even though we have been talking of gender gender sensitivity and gender biases from the word gender bias we have now come to a more sophisticated term that is gender gender sensitivity however it still exists in various forms one of the reasons is the slowing of agricultural growth climate change of course land degradation shrinking of biodiversity and so on now to begin with what malnutrition is it's basically a very broad term commonly used as an alternative to undernutrition but technically it is also referring to overnutrition people are malnourished if their diets do not provide adequate calories we already know that for growth maintenance and so on and leading to illness or because of illness and that is undernutrition and we also have overnutrition so basically you have undernutrition hidden hunger or micronutrient related malnutrition and overweight and obesity now micronutrient malnutrition or hidden hunger is something that we have to bring into the limelight very soon apart from the fact that overweight and obesity is also been seen this again sadly enough is not just in the urban areas but it is spreading its tentacles in the towns small smaller uh, towns and also in the rural areas so you have inadequacies in intake of vitamins minerals which are called together as micro nutrients and these can be grouped together micro nutrients enable the body to produce enzymes hormones and other substances we all are aware of the role iodine vitamin a and iron these are some of the more important ones especially in terms of public health nutrition and their deficiency is like a threat to the health and development of population particularly again the vulnerable and marginalized section pregnant lactating mothers adolescent girls and women in low economic countries i will not go over uh, this in detail all of us are very much aware about the causes of malnutrition we talk of inadequate dietary intake household insecurity distribution of food right from the house to later on in the community is not even or not equal inadequate care unhealthy environment health services are not available it is very very shameful and i feel very uh, upset to you know when when you hear that you uh, on one hand we are making such lovely scientific progress the other day one of my maids was telling me that her father could not be taken to the hospital in our village because there is no hospital uh you have to go for more than 2 hours from her home there is no transport they had to strap her father on a thela gadi and then take him for 2 hours on the road to a hospital so when you hear of these things you really start wondering what exactly is the progress that we are doing when basic things like these are not available to the people so you have lack of health services there is of course poverty employment problems and so on and so forth and these together will become the entire you know package deal for malnutrition i want to put in a little word about what nfhs is because a lot of our studies our talks our data that we get we rely on what nfhs now it's a large scale multi round survey the full form is national family health survey and it is conducted to a representative sample of households throughout india we have to remember also that it's a government who is done doing this and it comes under the stewardship of ministry of health and family welfare began in 92 93 and we have more than 18 research organizations who are carrying out different types and quantums of surveys in our country in different states of our country now the 1921 the current one called as nfhs 5 is the fifth of the series 
And that is what we are all going to refer to now for our statistics and for the information of what, on which type and how the malnutrition is currently existing. But of course, you have NFHS score because we want to compare and we have to see whether we have, you know, bettered ourselves or we are not done as good and so on. Now, to begin with, NFHS 5 has upgraded itself. It has added preschool education, disability, access to toilet facility, registration of death. Birth registration had already begun long back. Now, death registration, uh, bathing practices. Now, these are certain things in rural areas, very much predominant uh, practices during menstruation for young girls and women. And some of these are literally, you know, like marginalizing them even more. Methods and reasons for abortions, MTPs, and why this is happening. Why is it that family planning, family birth control programs are uh, not really happening to the extent that they should, and so on and so forth. The NFHS 5 has also included the waist and hip circumference now, because just weight and weight for height was not sufficient enough. So it's very nice that WHR is included. Certain biochemical parameters, blood pressure, blood glucose. And in fact, uh, I remember reading that in a couple of states, they have also done cholesterol and triglycerides. However, it has not been done across. I guess probably because of the two years of pandemic that certain things were not possible to be done to the same extent. However, some states have done that. Now. When you look at NFHS 5, child nutrition indicators show mixed patterns along this across the states. Now, in many states and uni, uh, union territories, there have been, uh, you know, upgrades. Things have improved, but there have been deteriorations also in some minor, in some major. Drastic changes, however, we are very happy to note, have taken in respect of stunting and wasting. But they are not over a short period of time. It is across the uh, NFHS 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 that we are observing that this has improved. Now, the progress is improved in specially stunting. It has reduced from 38.4 to 35.5. Wasting, again, has reduced from 21.0 to 19.3. Underweight has reduced from 35.8 to 32.1. This is the statistics presented. However, there are some deliberations about the sample size taken and the cutoffs used and so on and so forth. However, all in all, this is showing a positive change. However, overweight has increased from 2.1 uh, to 3.4%. Anemia 2 has increased to a great extent, I mean, which was not expected. This is one of the most unexpected thing especially because we have the anima, anemia mukt bharat that is the flagship that was uh, started however even under that anemia seems to have increased women and children continue to be having being anemic and it's a cause of concern in almost 13 of the 22 states and union territories there have been increase in prevalence of anemia among women and children compared to nfhs 4 okay increase in pregnant women is 1.8%, almost 2%, and in some states, more than 2%. Among all women in the reproductive age, that is including some of the 18 plus girls, or even younger, 3.9% to even 5% in some areas. And in adolescents, it is 5%. So, which is quite a large number, thinking of the fact that we are doing the sup supplying of folate, iron, there is an Anemia Mukta Bharat Abhyan happening. There is, I mean, things seem to be in place to prevent or rather to regress the anemia. However, that has not happened. In children, on the other hand, there is a very high increase, 8.5% and closer to those recorded. We are going back. We are, you know, uh, going back, de degressing to NFHS 3. So it was almost 70% then, and we are almost touching that level in case of children, which is an alarming condition. Recently released findings uh, show that prevalence of anemia has increased in children, women, 
pregnant and also in men. All these years, not a lot of emphasis was given to anemia in men, but it has been seen that even in men, it has increased. And this is almost in all states, except a very few. So all the measures taken do not seem to yield significant uh, positive results. Even the National Health Mission, which has given a budget of 940.1 crore for Anemia Mukh Bharat, they have hiked it up from 851 to 940. And uh, this uh, program was supposed to be one of the, like, you know, a real, uh, we were looking forward to positive outcomes. However, it has increased from 52.5% to 52.9%. So 97% of adolescents, now if you look at the remote areas, Northeast, Ladakh, and so on. Now 97 is an abyssal amount. I mean, it's a real pathetic state where 97% of adolescent girls, women in Ladakh and 15 to 19 age group are found to be anemic. And uh, this is an increase from 81.6% was anyways high during NFHS 4, which has become alarming, that is 97%, something which we have to think about. On the larger states, the prevalence was high in West Bengal, 70.8. From 62.2, it has shot up to that, followed by Gujarat, which is now 69%. Assam showed a prevalence of 67%, which is an increase of 24.3%. Now, this is more alarming than the number itself, such a big increase. This is how the comparison of NFHS 4 and 5 of children, I don't know if you can see it clearly, it's kind of pixelated a little, but uh, here we can see that uh, wasting, overweight, and uh, severely wasted has reduced. However, you can look at the figures for anemia. Okay, and stunting. These are the India's child malnutrition map. You can see the red and the light red and whatever those color schemes are going to depict how the lowest where it is and highest. And this is for stunting. National average is 34.36%. So we feel happy when we hear or read the word reduced. But when we look at the national average, when we look at a state average, when we look at a gender average, it is then that our eyes open wide. So double burden, Anaga also spoke a little bit of this. So this is the ba basic culprit. Now, it's like we don't know whether we are going right or left because we are going both ways. So you have the double burden of malnutrition. There is continuous persistence of undernutrition among children along with increasing overweight. So earlier on, Earlier meaning many, many years back, my early is very early because I began going for all these, uh, you know, my uh, so-called Gautan and village and uh, my people in the house used to ask me, oh, you're going back again to the villages, I said, yes. So this, I began in 87, I guess, I think 86 or 87, that was first uh, visit. I think Eileen and all were also there, one of the batches which I had taken with me. So we used to go nearer to Mumbai and I have been a couple of years back. Now, my only cause of concern over here, what I've seen, the difference when I went in 88, when I went in 98, when I went in 2008 and when I went in 2018, what I could see was that, you know, that you could actually see the warnings of the double burden. I could see all packets of chips and vapors and n number of things sold for 5 rupees, 10 rupees, hanging out there in those tiny little panbidi shops on the outskirts of the villages, in the villages, even in so-called remote areas of the villages. So I got me thinking that when somebody does not have medical facilities and has to be strapped onto a tela gadi to be taken to a hospital, but that village too is having all the possible packaged uh, snacks that are available. I don't want to take brand names, but inadvertently, if I do, I'll be, I'm sorry about it. But yes, you have packets all over the place. So it got me thinking that this is the basic change. I'm still seeing posher and I'm still seeing marasmus and I'm still seeing overweight. And I was shocked to see that in villages 
I did not expect to see that in villages. Yes, of course, it is not a percentage or a double, you know, uh, numerical figure that I can put across. But sometimes that one is also a sign of warning. We uh, often go by statistics and we, we often ignore men too. And that is what we have to open our eyes to. So, you know, like they say, uh, stitch in time saves nine. It's literally like that. Now in China, especially rural urban difference in obesity prevalence was reduced. And I'm sure it has reduced even in our country. These forms of malnutrition are mainly because there is uneven access to food and unbalanced diet. I'm again not saying deprived diet. They are unbalanced. They are unbalanced because they are laying emphasis on certain foods. Both under and over nutritions are in fact problems of poverty. And they're bound to become even more closely interwoven. And they are immediate and root cause of malnutrition. Hunger and obesity afflict both. It is such a uh, controversial thing or, you know, uh, something which we are contradictory rather, but they are both afflicting the poor. I will just give you one example. In 2011 or, yeah, I think 11, one of my students for an MSc had done a study in the slums of Dharavi on adolescent girls, on their dietary intake and on anemia. And that is when we had also written uh, to the Ministry for Supplementation of Folic Acid Tablets to the girls, uh, to the Kishori Yojana of ICDS. And luckily uh, that started then. So here what I found was my student actually, she did it, I was her guide. She had collected a good number of uh, adolescent girls sample. We found that all nutrients were lacking in their FFQ and in their dietary recall, except fat. The intake of fat was more than 50% of the RDA and more than 50% of their calories were coming from fat. So when we looked at what they were eating, one of the things was their mothers, many of them were, uh, you know, maids in, working in different homes. They would cook the dal chawal or whatever, chapati, bhakti, rice, whatever, and go. These children used to go to school, the girls, they wouldn't eat that food or probably just may take a hand, little bit of it. They were given five rupees. Now, this was in 2011. Very often, they took five rupees. And on their way, uh, uh, many of them bought bhaji pao. You know, it was not vada pao. It was bhaji pao that uh, was being bought. And they would eat that. That was their lunch. Many of them bought packets of X brand of wafer over the more popular international brand. So when I tried asking them, why are you buying this particular brand? So I was, uh, you know, enlightened. I was told that this Indian brand gives you more wafers for five rupees than that international brand. And that is why they used to buy this particular brand. So this was their lunch. This was what they were eating. So naturally the fat component, even among the low economic section was increasing. Countries are famine and undernutrition are traditionally main issues. The reverse is now the case. So you have overnutrition increasing in India, especially countries who have become more affluent recently. There you will see overnutrition. Rapid urbanization is linked to diets with more fat, animal source foods, processed products, low activity levels, and high level of obesity is the result. So here you can see a picture in the village and you can look at the child there. So it is not about just urbanization and industrialization, which were the two pet words we used years and years ago. Today, we are in a mess because we really cannot pinpoint one or a single factor which is responsible for this dual burden. So number of surveys were government of India and regional studies have also reconfirmed and all these NFHS 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 rounds are also showing a decline in underweight. However, it's highlighting overweight and obesity. It is also highlighting dose response relationships with different micro and macronutrient consumption along with overweight and obesity. This has been established. Like many of us are aware of research papers where anemia is predominantly seen in overweight and obese individuals also. So also certain other micronutrient deficiencies are observed which go hand in hand with overweight and obese. 
So overnutrition has its own implications apart from the deficiencies, the NCDs, the cardiometabolic conditions, all this leading to your non-communicable diseases. And we are seeing that countries which are showing economic transition are the ones who are suffering or the ones who are showing this kind of a dual burden even more. This is again the transition paradox and globicity. So here you have urbanization, economic growth, technological changes for work, the work from home. I'm sure all of us in the last two years, apart from whatever else that we gained, we definitely gained some weight at least because it could be, I always say it could be stress related, it could be anything, but two years of work from home for many people. Of course, there were other issues which some others suffered from. So you have the starchy, low variety, low fat, high fiber, labor intensive work or leisure as compared to then increased fat, sugar, processed foods, shift in technology of work and leisure. Even leisure, no one is playing now. Yes, they are playing, but everyone, everyone on their iPads or their laptops or on even their phones. I mean, children as small as two years cry because not they are hungry, but because their mother has taken away their cell phone. So this is how technology has also implicated, is implicated in globacity. So you have all this, I'm not going to go into details of all these, but you can see the transition paradox that we are observing now. Here, I fall back on Barker, one of my favorite theories, and it is true to a great, great extent. So you have the Barker's theory, where you have fetal origins, you have undernourished maternal malnutrition, the fetal genome, the fetal undernutrition, the nutrient demands exceeding the supply. So there is a lowering of the muscle mass, increased in the fat mass, increased cortisol, impaired development of organs like liver, pancreas, blood vessels, all converging in hyperlipidemia, hypertension, central obesity, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, and that is your NCDs, which uh, Barker's theory is really, we can see it live in a number of developing countries, especially so in our country. I would like to again highlight a little bit on adolescent health, also because a few of my researchers were on adolescent health. And one of my, my uh, thesis itself was on adolescent uh, weight and NCDs and so on. So with a sample size of 1,675 girls, I can say that there were some starkingly alarming things that came uh, to be observed. So almost all of them, almost all I can say that, had poor body composition with high body fat and low body muscle. Most of them were overweight as compared to being obese. Many of the participants were skipping meals. Energy dense snacks were what they were looking after, looking out to fast foods and aerated beverages. This was something again, very much popular. Consumption of high amounts of refined carbohydrates in one or the other form. Fats and low protein and low micronutrient was also seen in maximum number of participants. And all these belong to middle and upper middle income groups. None of them belong to the lower in income group. Uh, all of them had a very high intake of this. Eating out was on a regular basis or ordering. This has become like, uh, like uh, earlier on uh, in my young days, eating out was like a ceremony. I probably don't even recall going maybe once in a year to some place that too accompanied by parents and elders and everybody. It was a big thing. When we were in college studying also, we hardly frequented hotels because that was not done. Later on, yes, it became maybe once in a couple of months. Then people started going once a month. Then they started going once a week, weekends. And today I can see that almost three times a week there is ordering. So it was so funny when I asked them these questions about eating out. They said, nee, bahar to hum jada nahi jate hai, shayad ek bar I said, oh, good, that's good compared to the fact that, okay, 
पर आई सर वॉट अबाउट फूड कुक टो नो मैंने कल ना घर पे वो बाहर से खाना आया था सो ब्लेस गॉड ब्लेस स्विगी गॉड ब्लेस जोमैटो एंड द काइंड सो इट्स नॉट जस्ट अबाउट ईटिंग आउट बट इट इज ऑल्सो अबाउट ऑर्डरिंग फूड आई एम ईटिंग एट होम बट इट इज नॉट द होम फूड so this is also regular leading to a compromise on eating nutrient rich meals correlation of blood parameters was also done with anthropometry body composition and definitely anemia was seen with the overweight and obese and so also triglycerides and blood pressure and so on which was really sad because these girls were so so very young from the age of 14 to 20 so if you see trends of triglyc uh, dyslipidemia and elevated blood pressure which was something quite uh, you know alarming at this particular age and majority of the participants basically uh, they had uh, risk of non communicable diseases for the non communicable diseases now four rounds of the nnmb survey have also reiterated that though energy deficiency is decreasing the intake of micronutrients and certain food groups are below the rda set by icmr in fact in some places it is less than half of the rda set by icmr i have not gone into details state wise but uh, it is sad to know that where you are supposed to have say uh, 40 or 50 grams a day people are not even able to consume 20 grams of that particular food in fact even grains coarse grains whole grains and pulses have also decreased dark green leafy vegetables intake is pathetic especially in urban areas i guess because of uh, the working mothers the lifestyle and so on and of course fast food deep, deep fried foods processed foods are increasing uh, just recently somebody had uh, gone uh, you know told me that they had gone to badoda and uh, uh, so i said oh you must eat the traditional foods and you know certain things what did you eat she said no i ate butter cheese misal i said misal is from baroda i was not i mean i thought it's kolapur pune and so on and so forth she said no you have a uh, latest thing that is added on over there is butter cheese misal and i saw the picture of that butter cheese misal just looking at the picture made my heart skip a beat so you have a bowl of uh, lentils misal that is a mixture of sprouts and with spices and whatever and half a slab of amul 100 grams is added slab almost 50 grams or more of amul and almost about uh, you know i could see probably one one fourth to half a cup of grated cheese was put on top and of course topped with sev and buttered pav that is what was being i mean that is the speciality so it just got me thinking that you know here we are screaming ourselves hoarse with the kind of foods that one should eat or not eat and here you have innovations coming a long way where to anything and everything butter and cheese is added just the other day i was thinking it will not be far you know when during ganpati i was thinking somebody will actually be putting cheese is on and garnishing the modaks or probably the rishi ji bhaji will be have a th- one so these are some of the trends we are seeing today so when i speak about all this what is the relation and link and role so malnutrition hidden hunger nfhs and what happens to what anaga and uh, ida wanted me to speak on optimizing nutrition in children all these are very much interrelated very very much and we shall see how so here you have the infection and malnutrition cycle again not going in details we know of inadequate diet appetite loss malabsorption increased incidence of uh, severity the weight loss and i mean this is again a merry go round where you don't know where it begins and where it ends it is a cycle and one has to be careful because it is basically infection that gets the malnourished child to the mch or to the primary health center or it is infection or ncd in case of obesity which gets you to the doctor so factors begin with duration of breastfeeding availability of calorie dense foods at home what is it that you are getting to eat 
the nutrition security preferences increased consumption of sweet fatty fried foods and salty snacks now food and nutrition security let me tell you very often it is seen that amma cannot afford or those who do arrive when they get to eat they sometimes what happens is they try to take in much more than what they require i have observed this with examples with people in my own uh, vicinity so i had this group of women who uh, was who was being trained and they were in the village so when they were brought over here for the training uh, the first uh, couple of days they were told to serve themselves and eat whatever they want so they served themselves so much that they could not eat and some of them eat and eat and eat and as the days went by i could observe that the amount of rice or the papad or the fried food or whatever they were serving themselves reduced where they realize that i will be getting this it is there for the next meal nobody is going to take it away so somewhere the food insecurity also makes a person overeat that is also one of the possibilities and probabilities why again the barker's theory why again the under uh, privileged why again the deprived are showing trends of overweight and obesity skipping of meals so your brain tells you so basically kuch bhi nahi khaya now i can eat you know it's like a reward you are rewarding yourself because you did not eat anything since morning and therefore you don't think it is bad to dip a few khari biscuits in your tea and have because you didn't have breakfast you were uh, too busy to have lunch and now we have come home at 6 6:30 you are hungry and there's nothing there and you can see a bottle of khari biscuits and tea so your brain tells you that fine i skipped meals i can eat now there is lesser and lesser physical activity we are becoming more and more sedentary i just saw a uh, remote controls for fans in somebody's house and i was so much tempted to find out from where did you get this do you actually get remote controls for fans you said of course you get remote controls for fans you don't have to get up and lower the speed or increase the speed or do anything so our sedentary lifestyle is being blessed all the more overall stressful environment competition wanting to do better wanting to achieve better and there's nothing wrong in it but before time so when i tell my children that you know when i joined in 85 what was my salary it was 700 rupees they just laugh at me they say mama you won't even get one rubber proper chappal in 700 rupees that was your salary you didn't feel anything working like that i said no we didn't feel anything that was good enough for us today before their degree certificate is in hand they are thinking of 1 lakh salary so naturally the stress the competition it it is overwhelming that is going to have an effect and all this believe me affects the way you eat the food becomes solace food becomes something that uh, you know replaces anxiety and stress plus nuclear families time constraints you always had one grandmother or an atya or a maushi who would be there at home to clean the palak and the methi and you know do all those kind of things even there are so many people at home. but today who is there if the mother is working she is not going to come home you know i was just doing one topic on uh, forgotten vegetables and i was looking at that uh, uh, careful in maharashtra we call it or mocha in bengal uh, we have to literally peel every layer the purple layer then remove that inside thing then remove and it takes so long you to oil your palms and then you know you have to do it and i was thinking to myself who oh, haven't made it in the last couple of months so it was a regular feature once upon a time because we had people who would do it who is going to do it you also have affordable ready to eat food you cook food the cook food and overall demand for convenience has increased comforts have catalyzed food preferences so to, today if we invite somebody over or i am invited by somebody over to their house i do not expect the housewife or the hostess to have cooked everything uh, ma'am ma'am all time all due respect Will sorry is it time yes ma'am can you wind up in couple of minutes because we are okay okay fine i will do that
couple of minutes may not be possible i'll just skip all this <laughs> ma'am we would I, love to continue but uh, no, no, we've I'll already crossed all, 15 no, minutes no, no, you know that but then i will have to scholar skip all this other things yes, thank you so much fine fine i'll go to the last point okay so uh, yeah so sometime whenever there is time probably we can uh, talk about all these things but let me begin with the strategies and solutions because that is how we are going to optimize the nutrition so we have schemes policies and programs across sectors these have to be identified that could be used to reduce the density of the double burden data on macro and micronutrient intake among under and overnourished individuals is available and that can be obtained so that we can go ahead determinants like household contextual factors peer influences socio cultural environment business and neighborhood environment should be looked into there is no consensus on which interventions are likely to be effective to reduce density of dual nutrition so it is important to reduce the public health catastrophe without affecting the economic reforms so you have to engage different sectors of society right from public to private and convergence of health with non health sectors including urban planning education agriculture trade and market all this has to be done then also concentrated efforts to implement the policies and programs at all levels now we already have an infrastructure existing but unfortunately there are different programs and they are under different heads so you have something under the ministry of women and child development and you have something under the ministry of health and family welfare some things are also under the ministry of education so they can all be under one umbrella so that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing a working group is recommended for convergence between sectors and vertical programs trained counselors are already available so ncd clinics can be there catch up growth among low birth weight overfeeding all this has to be looked into infant and young child feeding programs can be revamped referral systems are existing which can be looked into and of course the community workers like asha anm eww they can be roped in major interventions are supplementation of specific micronutrients fortification of foods with micronutrients biofortification increase the dietary diversity and nutrition education so that you can encourage consumption of micronutrient rich food now what about us teachers can be trained as health ambassadors teacher training curriculum should include optimal nutrition and growth monitoring concept children in private schools and colleges can be focused and mandated for annual physical fitness pta in schools both public and private schools to improve the diet and physical activity have a look at the school canteens encourage children to take home cook meals integrate physical activity with cultural beliefs both in the school and colleges so it could be after the initial prayer in school 10 minutes of physical activity yoga or whatever you can have advocate uh, have advocacy with religious leaders to increase 5 to 10 minutes of physical activity after the prayers campaigns to make hf that is high fat salt and sugar food socially unacceptable revise the labeling of foods to identify the hf ss that is have the traffic lights green red and orange so people can just look at that red and say oh i will not eat it now and if you have eaten it then you will see that you take proper steps to not eat much more of it later make meal times a priority very important and do not make meal times netflix times because that is what is one of the reasons why one just tends to eat and overeat especially children monitor eating habits and set a good example behavior change campaigns for and by older children and adolescents in school itself the older children can have these campaigns for the younger ones create awareness of both under and over nutrition by checking family level risk factors restrict and reduce eating out or ordering out children and adolescents can be used as agents of change self help groups of mothers children and adolescents can be found modify the sought after fast foods to healthy nutritious versions nutritionists and food industries can promote social entrepreneurship we can uh, you know sponsor some of them training programs 
empower women entrepreneurs to supply healthy foods dehydration of vegetables at home and commercial can be added to meals kitchen gardens wherever possible power of microgreens nutrition education learning by doing one to one nutrition education encourage nutrition education material in local and regional languages and play way method and digital methods wherever possible because children are more attracted to that i would just like to talk a little about microgreens because this is a very doable thing to optimize nutrition we can grow microgreens teach the children the you know the middle level children to grow microgreens the mothers can grow microgreens and it can be an entrepreneurial activity also for some of the women of the lower economic group they have 4 to 40 times more nutrition cost effective rich in antioxidants easy to grow microgreens can be eaten in salads they are rich in a number of micro minerals these are some of the seeds that you can grow right from methi to mustard to green gram to radish and so on all these microgreens can be grown they can they are very very easy to grow you can grow them almost anywhere in plastic bottles tetra packs egg trays all your cotton soil little bit of cloth or gunny bag and plain paper wash the seed soak it use any container add the soil spread an inch of soil cotton cloth and then be taught to any child who is 6 and 7 and 8 year old also and the beauty of all this is that it's simple easy it involves the child and the adolescent and they will definitely eat it because that is their you know uh, contribution so these are some of the trials that have been had with the growing of microgreens in some of the urban slums very much possible and they were very happy to incorporate it in their children's diet so these are some of the uh, things that were made with the using the microgreens salad mixes sandwiches teplas parathas i mean even pulavs anything chutneys also depending on what microgreen it is so in conclusion to sum it all so government has definitely recorded high priority of the issue of malnutrition number of schemes like anganwadi services for adolescent girls pradhan mantri matru vandana yojana i mean there are number of names number of screens all these are happening and rehabilitation and poshan abhiyan uh, i mean there is so much happening there on paper all that we have to do is to see that it is actually seeing uh, you know it's actually uh, guided in the right way mission poshan 20 2.0 an integrated nutrition support program has been announced in 21 22 for all states it strengthens uh, it seeks to strengthen nutritional content delivery outcomes with a focus on developing practices that nurture health so as nutritionists as dietitian as students we have a hundred fold scope and a thousand fold responsibility over there steps have been taken to improve the nutritional quality you have accredited labs you have technology you have portion tracker to improve the governance so a lot of things are being put in place the use of ayush system for prevention of malnutrition and related diseases so there are number of programs like the portion vatikas in the anganwadi centers you have guidelines which are there for uh, accountability then however having said that much needs to be done in the area of micronutrient malnutrition especially b complexes and other minerals besides iron because iron is already in the forefront initiatives for overnutrition resulting in overweight and obesity and perpetuating ncd also need to be taken at war footing both in the rural and urban sector i guess this is what is very very important because uh, we are uh, rightly worried about the undernutrition but at the cost of ignoring the overnutrition now micronutrient malnutrition cannot be totally eradicated but eliminating and controlling the deficiency and health related consequences has to be a targeted program so although progress is occurring especially in iodine and vitamin a there is progress but other nutrients and hidden hunger which is going to cause compromised immune function increase risk of morbidity and mortality and cognitive development and growth 
and so on and so forth with children as well as adolescents is largely ignored and needs to be looked into. So you have a mix of different affordable interventions which are there and these have to be now put into practice. It is therefore the responsibility of each of us. As I mentioned earlier, because not only we are teachers, not only are we nutritionists, not only are we dietitians, we are responsible and accountable citizens and therefore we need to contribute wholeheartedly to the health and nutritional needs of vulnerable groups, especially women, infant, children and adolescents, so that we ensure good health for generations to come. So tackling both under and over nutrition by our own contribution at a practical level. So, so ma'am, can we take some of these points in the panel discussion? Uh, because uh, some of yeah. the panelists have uh, other commitments later on. Uh, fine, we can. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yes, we are done. So uh, it was a delight to listen to you after a long time again, ma'am. And, uh, yeah, and I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. No issues, ma'am. No issues at all. So... Uh, we would like to begin with the panel discussion. May I request all the panelists to please switch on your cameras. Um, Anagha, over to you. Yeah. So uh, now we come to the panel discussion and uh, without wasting much time, we would just like to focus here that in this panel discussion, we are going to focus on as dietitians, which are the different, different settings in which we encounter malnutrition and what could be some of the strategies to prevent or treat them. So, uh, yeah, Megha, can you please share the slides of, of the panelists? Thank you. So, yeah, so uh, one of our panelists is Dr. Anuradha Mitra, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Alka Jadha, ma'am, who's a professor of pediatric in gastroenterology and nutrition at local LTMG uh, Sign Hospital. She's in, in charge of NRCC, course coordinator faculty for MSc in pediatric nutrition at SVT College, and she's published more than 30 uh, research uh, papers. Next, please. Ms. Jayashri Paranjpe, she's a registered dietitian and RD trainer. She's a senior dietitian at BYL Nair Hospital. She's a vice president of IDA Mumbai chapter. She has a vast experience in clinical nutrition and her area of interest remains in parental nutrition, pediatric nutrition, and community nutrition. Next, please. Dr. Eileen Kande, ma'am, she's head dietitian, dietitian HOD uh, at Sir HN Reliance Foundation Hospital. She has experience of more than two, two to three decades. She's PhD in nutrition, RD board member, and she's got uh, multiple in publications in national and international journals. Thank you. Next. Neeti Desai, ma'am, she's consultant nutritionist practicing in uh, South Mumbai. She's attached to Kambala Hill Hospital. She's secretary and master trainer, Association of Diabetes Educator. She is joint treasurer, ID Mumbai chapter, and official nutritionist, Feminine Miss India 2008. Next. Dr. Pritesh Patel, she is a manager of scientific and medical affairs about Nutrition India, ex assistant manager of medical affairs, Dan in India. He specializes in nutrition specific communication, specific content developments, and scientific knowledge dissemination. Yeah. Mika, can you sh stop sharing the screen? Okay. So we would like to. Uh, Begin with Jayashri Paranjpe, ma'am, who is working as a dietitian at BY Nair Hospital, which happens to be a municipal hospital or a government setup. So, uh, ma'am, could you could you uh, put your video on? Okay. So the question is: Malnutrition is a vicious cycle, uh, and associated with poor clinical uh, outcomes. Now, in your settings, what is the spectrum of malnutrition you see? that is particularly in children, and what are some of the health conditions or clinical disorders where you see highest prevalence of malnutrition? Thank you, Adaga, from the, uh, for the warm introduction. Um, without wasting time, I will come to the uh, topic of discussion today. Normally, when it comes to government setting, we feel it is uh, mainly the pediatric population and we are talking about SAM and MAM kids where we observe malnutrition. I mean, that is what the take is. But what we see in our setup is um, every patient who is admitted in our uh, setting, either he gets admitted with malnutrition or the longer stay in hospital. And the various procedures that that patient has to undergo 
um, that can, uh, you know, worsen his condition and that way also the malnutrition sets in. So I feel ki we should not limit ourselves to thinking that uh, malnutrition in government hospital is restricted to children, but even conditions like say cancer or some heart, dis heart conditions, dysphagia, um, stroke patients, all these various conditions uh, can result in uh, malnutrition in hospital setup, especially in government setup. And uh, it is not necessary that all these patients are coming from a lower socioeconomic background. Even those who are coming from so-called uh, middle uh, income group population, even there we observe uh, malnutrition because of our poor eating habits and the lifestyle that now we are, uh, you know, leading. Right. So I think I have. So, ma'am, rightly put, malnutrition can exist in any different any setting that we uh, see. It could be in a government setting. We also have Dr. Eileen Candy here, who sees a different set of patients, different category of patients. So, in contrast, uh, do you see, do you really see patients who also show signs of malnutrition, particularly with the ones that come from affluent section of the society? And do you really see the malnutrition uh, as a visible sign or is it an, you know, a hidden hunger, like we rightly say, say? So do you see it as a hidden hunger in these patients? Yeah, I Sorry. Yeah. Um, the uh, word hunger, actually, when you talk about hunger, it calls to, a, to your mind a very thin, starving person, you know, in... Uh, who is really in need of food. But uh, frankly, malnutrition is universal and this issue is all over the world, whether it is the most affluent nations, whether it is most uh, affluent hospitals also. Uh, in our hospital, uh, we, in fact, because of the Joint Commission International, that's the JCI standards and the NABH standards, we have uh, one thing that is mandatory is to check for malnutrition. And this check happens within the first 24 hours uh, of the patient's admission. Uh, when patients get admitted, especially who are catabolic in uh, nature, they, they do come under a very high uh, malnutrition score because we have uh, internationally uh, you know, validated tools that we use to actually accurately check malnutrition, whether we use the MUST in an OPD setting or we use the NRS in our ICUs or we use the SGA in our IP wards, we are using these tools which are uh, validated to uh, find uh, how, how much a patient is malnourished. And being affluent does not really uh, change any status of people because uh, of, uh, as you rightly said, hidden hunger, and we have the dual burden of malnutrition. So we have the obese uh, people who are also malnourished because they have other non-communicable diseases plus they are micronutrient deficient. So these kind of malnutrition also, uh, you know, uh, we, we find. Right. And since you mentioned about uh, patients coming to you in the hospital through, you know, with the sign of malnutrition, uh, do you start with, apart from the dietary interventions, do you start with other interventions or micronutrient supplementation right from the start? Do you think that's a necessity? in the setup? Yeah, so uh, it is all depends upon which setup we are talking about. So in the ICU, we definitely start with micronutrients uh, immediately. We start with vitamins and minerals like vitamin D, et cetera, uh, immediately. In an OPD setup, when we get patients with micronutrient deficiencies, we do begin uh, them with certain uh, micronutrients also because uh, when we do an array of tests, we find, especially in our executive health checkups, uh, we find that patients are deficient in, say, B12, they have deficiency in, uh, you know, vitamin D and small other iron deficiency, anemia, all these things are prevalent even uh, in people who uh, are not really non-affording where food is concerned. Right. Uh, we, we start uh, giving them uh, micronutrients uh, right from the beginning, even though they may have, be having excessive calories in terms of 
you know uh, fats and uh, sugary foods or uh, calorie dense foods but they will be micronutrient deficient so we start with them with zinc selenium and all these uh, nutrients if uh, found deficient in their diet we begin uh, giving them as soon as possible okay so this also confirms that irrespective of this, the whether it's a government hospital or a private hospital, the prevalence of malnutrition very much remains uh, the same among the hospitalized patients. We would now, now would like to uh, move to Dr. Alka Jadama for the next question. The cases seen in NRCs are different from those seen at hospital, ma'am. So how is the approach to manage of you know the acute and chronic cases in NRC setting? Thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So thank you very much. Actually, in NRC, we see actually three types of cases. Children who are younger than six months, where there is a breastfeeding failure, we call them as failure to thrive. Between six months to five years, what we see is severe acute malnutrition and moderate acute malnutrition. Very much is spoken about severe acute malnutrition with various government programs. But what I would like to stress is a moderate acute malnutrition. This moderate acute malnutrition where on anthropometry we have a weight as well as height and a MUI between 11.5 to 12.5 centimeters. And they, we classify them as vulnerable MAM and non-vulnerable or the safe MAM. This safe man can be managed at community level, but vulnerable moderate acute malnutrition, we treat them at par with severe acute malnutrition. So this is about the acute malnutrition. We see children with chronic stunting or st uh, chronic malnutrition. So the stunted children which they come to us, they are referred to us by thin, but on anthropometry, they are normal but their height for age is small. So they definitely have. So these are apart from them, we see hidden hunger in the form of pallor. We see lots of rickets. We see a lot of alopecia hair problems related to zinc deficiency. We see the change in the hair color related to the protein deficiency. And all the children on treatment really develop a shiny skin and a good hair. So these are our clinical spectrum of nutritional disorders, which we see at NRC. Also, ma'am, UNICEF recommends ready to use, uh, ready to eat supplementary and therapeutic foods for management of salmon, ma'am. So can these be prepared in community level as well? And are commercially available, are, are UTF or are USF recommended in NRC? What's your experience about that? Yeah. Actually, the standard of care is effectively, if you come down with any illness, we give you the medicine. The same way, your senior acute malnutrition is actually a condition which is a non-communicable disease. Okay, mm -hmm. so we treat this condition for a period of 8 to 12 weeks, depending on the response of the child with RUTF if you are SAM, with RUSF if you are vulnerable ma'am or ma'am, and then afterwards, we do a parent education program where patient goes back to his home family diet. So we definitely take an opportunity to treat it with RUTF. RUTF is available first. We have a production unit. In fact, we are the only center having a production unit in India which produces this ready-to-use therapeutic food, which gives around 515 kilocalories and 15 grams of proteins. It is also commercially available by, by various nutraceutical companies. But government of India has made a mandate that those who can afford and buy should buy it. But otherwise, in the ICDS in rural area and in selected urban area makes this energy dense nutritious food available with the help of local self-help groups. So this is the take home message. We can still train the mother to make a special feed home. So both the ways we can definitely help the mother. So ma'am, as they say, uh, it takes a community to feed a child, you know, and uh, it definitely takes the community. Everybody needs to come together. And I think self-help groups would be a big help wherever patients are not able to afford the commercially available RUSF and RUTF. Uh, so Mitra ma'am, you've worked with a lot of these, uh, you know, community level uh, 
you know, you've gone to the community and worked in different parts of, uh, you know, Maharashtra. So you've worked extensively with ICDS for the last four decades, I, I could say. How do you think has ICDS evolved over a period of time? And what is the scope that we see in order to kind of ensure that there's nutrition adequacy in children? Uh, I remember one story where, you know, a child, there was a child in uh, where my granny used to stay and in the village, he would just go to every class in the morning, he would attend play school because he would get Shira over there. Then he would again go back to the primary school because he would again get Shira and again in the evening. So he ate Shira three times a day. But did it really uh, kind of help the child? You know, the theme for this year is Bache Ka Potion and Padhai both. So are we really kind of getting there in terms of ICDS? Uh, yeah, thank you, Sukhada. Yes, um, it has been a journey uh, with a lot of experiences with ICDS. So uh, initially, you know, in Mumbai especially, I, when uh, I had uh, gone to the little, little Anganwadis and all, that time it just like a teacher with a group of students. I was not on board with ICDS at that time. So we used to see that Banpa was given. This I'm talking about AP. Uh, 788 and that time and uh, in some of the places I still remember Andheri, Koldongri and those areas they were very uh, you know not so crowded then it was like uh, going you know very uh, uh, empty lonely kind of a place so there we uh, observed that the one power that was being given was not like up to the mark you know so I I just went to the office at Andheri near uh, Andheri West and I just happened to speak to one of the people as a team and there and, and you will not believe it so completely the action was taken and the next week that was not there I mean from that particular because they used to pass tenders you know then it so happened that much later they would get this upma and kind of different food so the Anganwadi in Kurad village in Malad used to get the upma from uh, JVLR somewhere from Kurla because of the tenders passed. And the children, the small children would not eat it because can you imagine, first of all, that upma would be not with like, you know, how we make at home. And then it is like one lump of rava there. How are they going to eat it? So immediately uh, this was talked about. And again, ICDS, I mean, I must say that with all the kind of things they have to go through, because it's not a decision they take, you know, it's like a central government, even today for cooking purposes, uh, in most of the states, the center, central government gives the money for cooking. Okay, it is 1910. In the Union Territories and Northeast, it is 64. I don't know the kind of all this, but it is like that. So they started a thing where uh, the local self-help group, the Bachadgad of women in that particular area were then involved in making this hot meals. So no longer tenders passed. So we, which was a very big step. Today, if I go and see the kind of food that is given. So in Kurad, the food is coming from Kurad. In a particular in Goregao. So it may be from a locality nearby. And what the positive thing is that these budget cut ladies, many of their children, own children may be in the Anganwadis, you know, they, yes. and they, they have this kind of, a, the uh, they feel cohesiveness towards that community, towards their, so uh, there is more than just cooking, you know, so there is a lot of care taken. We That's an excellent done, point, ma'am. So like you, uh, you know, this year's theme. They have come a long way. I mean, yeah. people uh, generally, those who have actually not gone into the ICDS, uh, very loosely say Kya hai, government ka ye hai. Yeah, but yeah. it is not let me tell you to run an anganwadi in mumbai with small small kholis you know in the slum areas you have 60 70 children what are they going to do mm. but, but there is not a frown on the face of these ladies they yeah. are all the time smiling they are teaching them this barbar gani and yeah. potion gun and you know doing their we job. did a program with them last year ma'am and that kind of showed us the kind of activities yes. that they do and i think uh, that's the reason why there's so much focus on you know growing the vegetables locally trying to teach right. them kitchen gardening on yes. during the potion yes. uh, maha as well uh, that brings me to a point where a lot of influence happens on the social media right so uh, Neeti ma'am since you see a lot of the crowd from uh, South Mumbai so to say do you see that 
lot of youngsters, you know, or, as well as people who were trying to kind of combat NCDs, uh, following certain fat diets. And as a result of that, do you see any specific type of micronutrient deficiencies increasing in, in the population? Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Ma'am, you're on mute, yeah. Uh, you're absolutely right, Sukhada. Thank you, IDA, for having me here. Uh, fat diets is, I think, what we see in the upper socioeconomic group. People are following, you know, they're trying to do intermittent fasting. And we have so many kids who are doing IF. And then there is complete elimination of fruits, nuts, seeds in the diet because there is no time. They are eating only between 1 p.m. and 10 p.m., which again is it's not the ideal items, but there is no time for the, the, the healthy foods. So we've had, I've seen quite a few uh, young boys and girls who have complained about hair fall, hair loss, uh, when they are doing their IF because there is clearly micronutrient deficiency because the, 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 the certain food groups are just not taken in. The other fat that is on is, you know, going vegan. A lot of people are trying to go vegan. Uh, most of us are anyway vegetarians and now you're, you're eliminating milk. Uh, so there is this huge risk of having then calcium and vitamin B12 deficiency and which we see, which we see very uh, commonly. So yes, I think people following keto diets, there's always a risk of B vitamins because you are eliminating carbohydrates to a large extent. So yes, in the lower, in the middle income group, I think it's the intake of processed foods, the khari and the butter biscuits, and the just, you know, refined rice in terms of poha, refined suji in terms of upma, biscuits for snacks, namkeen for evening snacks. That is, I think, the cause for micronutrient deficiency in that, in that uh, socioeconomic group. Thank you, ma'am, for that explanation. I would like to ask the next question to Dr. Patel. Uh, it's often said that, you know, I mean, there's a thought or a belief in some uh, set of uh, uh, faculties or uh, dietitians also that supplements may be harmful or, you know, they're expensive. But actually to prepare a supplement, I'm sure the companies do a lot of R&D and a lot of studies before you develop a product or come up with a product. So could you throw some light on the R&D undertaken to ensure the safety of a product? Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, IDA, as well as, uh, you know, HADSA committee members for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this panel discussion. Um, so uh, I think it is a very fair, uh, you know, question because this has been, uh, you know, real uh, concern. So uh, definitely, you know, when you talk about the supplementation, there are different kinds of supplementation. Uh, those are basically majorly or major of majority of them, they are, you know, regulated by the local regulations. So if we talk about India, there is a, a food safety and standards authority of India, there is a, a food and drug authorities, there are multiple guidelines as well uh, available. So now these supplements that are, you know, basically that are sold, uh, these are, you know, all you know, as per the mandatory requirements of these regulations. And when, you know, any commercial supplementations are made, they are not being made as per, you know, the choice or the uh, desire of any company. So they are definitely followed and regulated as per the guidelines. So there are multiple guidelines, but we have the most uh, important one, which is our Indian. So ICMR and, uh, you know, NIN guidelines, there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the RDS that are given. So all these supplements that are made, they usually strictly follow the guidelines and, you know, the dietary allowances that are uh, required and you know given by that so what is more important from the safety perspective is definitely the r d that has been done by the companies apart from that is you know being regulated so not bridging or you know exceeding the upper tolerable limits because these guidelines and upper tolerable limits they are basically on each and every nutrient that are there and these nutrients and there is already defined these limits uh, apart from this, the another way is definitely, so it is very difficult, and especially when it comes to the uh, pediatric age group, it is very difficult to 
conduct these, uh, you know, uh, safety and efficacy studies. So the best way to do it is, uh, you know, to continuous monitoring. So we do have, uh, you know, all the companies, they have a continuous monitoring from the, uh, you know, the, from the perspective of quality assessments uh, and improvement uh, via consumer complaints. So we record each and every complaints that is coming from the consumers. We analyze them and we continuously, you know, improve the quality and manage in this case. So in that way, you know, all the supplementations that are, you know, present, uh, you know, in the market, they are basically in line with the newer regulations. So from the perspective of safety concerns, so if it is under the regulated market, definitely there is no concern. But, you know, like uh, Dr. Anuradha ma'am said that, you know, uh, the unregulated market, let's say for the, the example that she said that, you know, butter cheese, uh, missile power. So that is definitely, you know, not regulated. So there, that is basically a concern. So I think uh, I, have, I have a follow-up question to you and uh, I come from a similar background as you. So uh, without any bias here, uh, as dietitians, there are a lot of dietitians and students on the panel today, on the attendee list today. Uh, how does a dietitian really choose a supplement? Uh, how does she ensure that this is a quality supplement? And uh, then maybe I could extend this question also to the dietitians who are on the panel that how do you go ahead and select the right supplement for uh, you know, as an adjunct to the diet therapy. All right. Uh, so, you know, to be honest, there is no one for all kind of a supplement that is available. So there are different conditions according to the conditions that are there. And if it also impacts the age group. So starting from the babies to toddlers to, uh, you know, the teenagers, uh, adults and, you know, elderly patients. So they all have different needs. And according to their needs and requirements, these supplements are available. So first thing is as per the requirement and age group. Second is that there are there is also classification of you know uh, health supplements that are having a very specific role of those specific nutrients there is a general uh, you know wellness uh, kind of a supplements as well and there is a specific micronutrients as well so depending upon what kind of patients are there or you know the general population is there what is your target uh, you know uh, patients that you want to uh, treat or manage in that way, there are different types of uh, available. So uh, from the, if I give you the industry perspective, uh, we usually try to make the products that, uh, you know, apart from, so it tries to cover the majority of the population. So whatever there are that it, it usually covers that. But definitely those customized uh, options are yet to come to India. Most probably in the future, we might have it. But from the choice perspective, there are different requirements. And as per the requirements, the suitable product will be, uh, you know, uh, recommended by the either the doctor or the dietitian. So that's an innovation I think we'll look forward to, to receive having customized uh, yes, supplements in the market as well. Uh, diet for one can be customized and dietitians play mm. a lot of role in customizing yes. the diets and individualizing the diet. So diet still remains the cornerstone to fight malnutrition. And uh, I think the next question would be for Jayashree ma'am. Uh, in her setting, um, you know, uh, we may prescribe all that we like, but uh, if the patient does not have access to uh, even like you know, you, you might say uh, some background noise. So we may try uh, all that we, we want, uh, but if if the patient is not compliant enough, we may not be able to achieve it. So how do you really ensure compliance? Particularly when we are wanting them to eat, you know, five serving of fruit and veg, and if the patient cannot afford it, uh, they would want to spend it, let's say, on a vada pav or a, you know, a Chinese item. How do we ensure compliance in these patients in our setting? Uh, that's an interesting and good question. Uh, because, uh, see, we just don't eat uh, for health. Unfortunately, that, that is the truth. We eat, a, it's a pleasure. So we need away patients from Vadapao and Chinese to however healthy food it may be. So whenever we do assessments, many a times we find that they, they are like, when we take their uh, expenditure, uh, can you just excuse me for a minute so that I can lower the background noise. You can ask my question to somebody else till I come back. 
if you don't mind. I think we can ask the same question to Eileen, ma'am, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, can you repeat the uh, gist of the question? So how do about you how to compliance? Uh, compliance, is that yes, right? Yes, 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 yeah. that's correct. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, what is important for when compliance is concerned it is education. And I think that is what is lacking. So, in the beginning, in fact, we train all our dietitians that the education should begin at assessment itself. So when you are taking the assessment of the patient and you are taking, say, the history of the patient or what patient eats uh, our 24 hours we call, at that time itself, we can start with the education. And education is like a long-term process. It is not a you know, one-time process. So it will keep on going on till uh, you know, some kind of... Uh, uh, because out of the 10 things that you have told you know, the patient, they may just follow even five. And it is an achievement for us that even if they followed five of what we have recommended, I think uh, that is itself uh, an achievement. But more than anything, I think education, explaining to them is also sustainable. Do whatever you say. But, you know, uh, for long-term sustenance, these kind of these patients should be called for follow up and they should be encouraged from time to time. Right. Yeah, that's it. So I think I'll extend this question again further to Alka, ma'am, as well. Uh, so, ma'am, if you're here, uh, compliance in these pediatric populations who are with Sam, ma'am, they come with very uh, severe conditions. They might uh, require medical care as well. Do you, do you think compliance is an issue there in NRC and uh, what are the other challenges that you face in NRC in order to meet the nutritional requirements? Yeah. In NRC, actually, we meet a lot of challenges. One of them is, uh, one thing is uh, distances. The traveling to yeah. the NRC itself is a problem. Second thing, they have to come back again for food and once the child is little better, they feel that the food, uh, they can manage with the home food. So once they're a little better, they stop coming. Mm. Apart from that, we have a large family size, sharing of our RUTF with others. Yeah. You know, these are few challenges which we are really uh, facing. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I think, very commonly seen even when meals are provided in the schools. Uh, you know, younger uh, siblings might carry it back home because the other sibling likes it. And that happens quite a lot. Uh, so in ICDS, ma'am, you know, when the mid, uh, this question is for Mitra, ma'am, when midday meal is served, uh, often now I work with an NGO here in Mumbai and they uh, try to provide interesting meals to the kids. So a kachdi is provided under the midday meal program, but there's also a healthy version of pav bhaji instead of the power or OT is up given by the NGO to the kids. Do you think that when we're trying to build healthy habits in children, you know, uh, trying to disguise nutrition in the form of yummy food is the way to go? How do we ensure that, you know, what we're trying to provide, because our intentions are good with midday meals. How do you ensure that we, you know, the kids end up eating what we're trying to give them? Yeah, so that's a very good thing if you are with an NGO. Because even uh, at home level, we have often done that. We have disguised things and, you know, like my child wouldn't have milk. So I would need the dough with the milk and make roti out of it or make a custard or something out of it. Even a nachni was, would be given as a custard instead of just the regular. Yeah. But the thing is with ICDS, since it is coming from the center and across states and decisions are very difficult to be taken at, uh, you know, uh, each Anganwadi level. And today what has happened is earlier when we went to the Anganwadis, we would do everything in Marathi and so on. But today the crowd is more cosmopolitan. You have people and migrants from all over India who are part and parcel of the Anganwadi. So I remember where a Nachni Ladu was very well accepted. Today some people don't because when they come from certain other states, they are not used to consuming Nachni. They you say, you know, ye kala kala kya de diya. We have had the these kind of experiences also so we have to look at it from in fact like an all india kind of a, is the food that they like or what is it that they are going to eat and also the money see so for per head per child if you are spending just about five rupees or 10 rupees or lesser than eight, even that and you want 500 calories and 12 to 15 grams of protein 
and it has to be cooked by a uh, semi trained kind of people who are you know they are they are trained with hygiene and they have get uh, all that but so one has to be very very practical about it so what we can do is which we have done also as a part of nutrition education sometimes when the thr or the take home ration that is a powder like your roof you know it is made specifically given to uh, referral service to children to pregnant lactating mothers and uh, we teach them how to incorporate that powder and what they can do out of it you know so and by and large people mothers in general are very open to anything that is suggested for the welfare of their child this is a universal thing that has been observed rarely you will come across a mother who will be lazy or who will not want to you know do something better for the child so what we have done is we have told them if your child is not eaten the khichdi or if he has not eaten the rava or he has not eaten chana boiled chana and some things like that take it home uh, they have given tiffin boxes for small children the anganwadi teachers are so good and like so i mean understanding they pack it up in these little tiffins for the children who don't eat it there the mother is told to take it home and then she has been we have devised recipes of these recipes whatever is done already to give it reincarnated into you know something which the child is going to eat so uh, the the upma is again Uh, mixed with curd and made like a curd upma with some flavor uh, uh, vagar put on it so yeah. then the it, the child finds it easier to eat it is value added also you are doing value addition to it also mm-hmm. the chana it can be mixed into the rice and made a chana pulao mm-hmm. or you can make a better usal with potatoes and cauliflower and everything added in the chana so it becomes a bhaji so we have tried those kind of things also at icds but the restraint or the uh, is restraining thing is the number the large number the uh, money that is spent on each child and apart from that i have also gone to some of the anganwadis in west bengal and other parts see there they are giving egg to the child twice a week egg is given to the child every alternate day soya bean vadi is made into a vegetable soya bean vadi uh, curry is made the child in the villages is supposed to take their own thali and go and the they, it is cooked in each anganwadi over there there it is not supplied because these are villages so they they are they, these ladies are employed to cook earlier the teachers were cooking but that has stopped so you have two cooks who are given x amount of money they do the marketing which is inspected by the teacher and for the week the menu is given and 9 99% it is khichdi with boiled egg next day it is bhat with the jhol jhol is the curry with vegetable and soya bean vadi then again khichdi with so these kind of things are given hot meals are given children mm-hmm. take their thalas they are served by the older children or the teachers then they are told to wash the thala they put it back into their bags they bring it home yeah. some children the mothers give tiffin because they don't eat yeah so they bring the boiled egg home and the mother puts it in the curry and gives it to the child So, so like are... you mentioned in your presentation, a lot of focus is played on kitchen gardening and introducing. This this year, the focus is on the tribal vegetables. And across India, you know, in different parts, there are so many different leafy vegetables which are a very rich source of vitamin A. Some of them even rich source of iron as well. So, uh, you know, if those need to be introduced to these children, uh, whether in ICDS or in our regular homes, you know. do you think that should be disguised or that they should be introduced so that no, you know the legacy uh, stays behind let me tell you two things about this disguising and so i have an experience with my child my daughter was uh, very small and the lady who looked after her was from the village and she somehow never liked to eat cauliflower french beans carrots this lady so whenever the food was cooked it used to be lal mat chauli methi you know these typical traditional bhajis and even a one and a half two year old girl would relish eating chauli mart and everything yeah. she just liked it and till date she her taste Loves is developed it. because and it was not disgusting yeah. whereas on the other hand my son <laughs> never touched these in the same house the same people the same environment i don't know he never liked these so for him it was you know removing the rice from the food removing the peas from the bhaji remo- so uh, it is very difficult for us to understand which child is going to 
take to what? Mm -hmm. What is the gut level taste of this child? Yeah, is it yeah. inherited? Is it experienced? Is it, you know, what kind of gut level taste it is? But you can try by in the original avatar. If they are not having it, then if you need to disguise it, yes. So I would make a green paratha for him, which used to be a paste of palak with a little methi, because if you grind too much of methi, it turns bitter. So a green paratha of different shape. And then, you know, so this was a child who was a little difficult to please and difficult in eating, probably. But for the other child, there was no problem. She could just have yeah, the... So you made a very relevant point, ma'am. So although we are looking at uh, mass level solutions to malnutrition, we still are cannot generalize it for everybody, no, be can. it a child or be it an adult. adult. So and that's a very relevant point. And here I would just like to add on, if you encourage the child to grow the vegetable themselves, then they are, you know, it's like, me. I have done this. This is my baby. I want to, so, you know, then they are encouraged. And this I have observed myself. So even in that small kundi pot, if I had put a little uh, bit of uh, methi seeds and let it sprout, I had uh, made, uh, put a chili plant. So I want to make, uh, I mean, put that chili in my dal. You know, it was like that. The chili I have grown or the methi I have grown. So microgreens come to your rescue over here because as I told you, they're very easy to grow yeah. and it can be like a project for the children. And yeah. you can have a competition, even in school children. Okay, you grow methi, you grow whatever, whatever. Let us all get this to your anganwadi. Let us look at the microgreens. And today's kichdi, we will add the microgreens. Yeah, so that is, that is something where you are involving them. They are also understanding. See, it is educating them also that yeah. these are good for you. Yeah. See, and then immediately the feedback, oh, yesterday you ate microgreens. So today all of you are looking so very bright and beautiful and all of you are so energetic. So it is registered in their head. Yes, yesterday I ate microgreens. Today I'm, you know, doing so well. So this kind of a reiteration of what they are eating and what is good for them becomes a education for them also in the long run. If you want it to be a habit for the long, for, you know, lifelong rather than that's just... True. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So healthy habits begin at a very young age and we yes. all need to remember you that. To, you, uh, there is effort yeah. and that effort has to be either a community effort or at the home level. But yeah. effort is there. Yeah. And innovatively, you have to do it. There are uh, no other ways. I mean, yeah. on, on, the, on the similar uh, level, I would like to ask Neeti, ma'am, how do you deal with uh, picky eaters or you know, kids particularly who are very choosy about foods and how to ensure diet diversity in them and what are some of the functional foods that you use for them? Are there any? Ma'am, Ma you're on mute. As Anuradha ma'am said, uh, they are, uh, there are children and then there are types of children. So for each, it is a different kind of uh, strategy. But what I have seen generally is that one, if one spends time uh, with the uh, child and one figures out what she or he likes and works around it, there are generally enough options. I mean, you know, I always tell them that you may not like 20 vegetables, but I'm sure you will like five vegetables. So the idea is to figure out those five and then encourage them to have. Similarly, a lot of them say, oh, I don't like fruits. I hate fruits. Again, I say, you know, there is a whole variety, but I'm sure you will like two or three. Um, uh, getting the, my, the micronutrients in, even forget micronutrients, even macronutrients in is a challenge, uh, especially protein. So uh, I do spend quite a bit of time. Very often parents say, oh, she has a class. She cannot come. Can I just come? Because anyways, I'm making the food. And I insist that, that the child is above three years, four years, who understands what she's eating, then she needs to be there for the consult because I may, we may put the best diet in the world on the piece of paper, but if the child is not going to like it, it's not going to work. So taking into consideration the likes and dislikes, very important. Also in the young age, as we know, the same food needs to be introduced almost 15 times, 16 times before we can say that the child will does not like the food. So reintroduction uh, in the infancy stage in the first toddler years, very important. Also, uh, as Vitra ma'am said that, you know, her daughter was very fond of the greens, but the son would not like it. So, but at the same time, do you see any role of 
like the parents or the family members also acts like a role model so if they also learn by you know imitating or seeing what the parents eat do you think there's an influence on that absolutely so again i um, tell the parents that ch- kids don't do what the, you ask them to do kids True. do what you do so yeah. i mean if you're going to sit and ha- uh, watch net- netflix and have a bag of chips and then you tell the child that no chips are uh, processed food you should not have them it doesn't work so mm-hmm. playing the role model is just too important for the parent the child is constantly taking in what he or he is seeing on the dining table not what she is being told by the parents or for that matter even the teachers so uh, role yeah, model uh, hal- is too important hello can i add something here yes yes ma'am please yeah so to take what uh, uh, neeti said right now uh, to take it further children learn by observation they are they do not learn by what is told to them having said that as she rightly said uh, nowadays children are very aware jai shri uh, uh, you know the complaints is better it is only mother if you tell or again there is noise no 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 is your no, voice no, go on, go on, yeah you speak continue yeah so as i said uh, many a times mothers like to pamper uh, the fathers so on the dining table they will be saying you know his father does not like this or uh, i do not like this and then you go and tell the child you know this healthy you must eat it now that doesn't work uh, with today's children if it is not good for uh, if it is good for me then it has to be good for you so as anaga said involving family and setting role models is very important when you are setting the trend also uh, now here we are not just talking about malnutrition in children we are talking about malnutrition in adults also so uh, when it comes to adult malnutrition we like to spend money on so many things including different addictions which the patients may have now i am talking about patients coming from lower socio economic group so there we will spend money on uh, say tobacco or any other addiction but we don't have money to spend on something which is healthy because somehow healthy is always considered to be expensive so uh, we have to set that record straight that healthy need not necessarily be expensive and one needs to make good choices now here the advertisements make a lot of Uh, i mean they have a lot of role to play because um, uh, you know things like biscuits somehow although it is never advertised to be healthy but patients uh, i mean the mothers when it comes to young kids or if it is adult certain foods are considered by us to be healthy and so they are incorporated in the diet so as uh, eileen also said nutrition awareness and nutrition education right from childhood goes hand in hand if you want to combat malnutrition thank you ma'am for that 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 input uh, we would like to next ask dr uh, patel that uh, it's often you know when you see a supplement you see a list of different micronutrients added in one supplement along with the carbohydrate protein fats all those you know nutrients together so uh, the nutrients which are provided in a supplement what is their bioavailability is it as same as food or so many nutrients present at one point of time uh, how exactly do they work you know and how to ensure that the nutrient in the supplement is actually absorbed and utilized in the body yeah uh, i think i think this is a very good question so we all usually you know nowadays there is a lot of literacy around what we eat how we eat how it gets you know absorbed and what is the bioavailability of it so uh, when we talk about the bioavailability i think that there is not difference as such not much of a difference uh, when it comes to uh, you know the food that we eat or cook at this at home or we take as a supplement now the reason behind it is 
that uh, it depends upon what kind of those nutrients that you add. So again, it goes to, you know, what I said earlier is that uh, depending upon those guidelines. So there are specific studies, there are specific guidelines that says that, you know, which particular nutrient is maximum, you know, have their bioavailability better absorbed in which form. So to include those forms in those supplementation is definitely going to help. Uh, coming towards your another question is that, you know, how do we no, you know, there are multiple nutrients together and, you know, the nutrient to nutrient interactions. Mm -hmm. So if you see, uh, basically, when we eat normal food, home cooked food, there is also a combination of nutrients in that food. So from the starting from the, you know, the cooking uh, till we eat and, you know, until it gets absorbed. So there are also combination and food. So nutrient to nutrient, um, you know, interaction happens there as well. The same thing happens with the supplementations also. Now, sometimes, you know, we cannot say that the bioavailability of a single nutrient is dependent only on one factor. There are multiple factors that impact the bioavailability. And sometimes the another nutrient helps in the absorption uh, of those nutrients. So we cannot say that, you know, one nutrient should be absorbed and metabolized separately. It is basically all nutrient together as a whole in a synergy that helps in, you know, the absorption as well as for the growth and development because they all complement each other. So similar wise, since the supplementation are also, if we talk from the raw material perspective, how they are developed and manufactured, it is also coming from the food. The sources are the food. There are few things that are definitely there which are synthetic, but then we are taking care of, you know, the forms which are easily absorbed and easily, you know, recognized by our system, uh, you know, as their own. So if you see an overall, uh, so supplementation is definitely, uh, 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 you know, from the perspective of bioavailability, it is same when we compare the, you know, the four, if not less, definitely not less, because um, if you see the quantities in the food of those nutrients differ from what it is in the supplementation, because again, the these guidelines and, you know, uh, the references that has been given that this much amount of protein or carbohydrates or, you know, the micronutrients are, you know, allowed, that is again based on your serum levels after the uh, the, that supplement has been taken. So that is again matched with your normal food, which is home cooked meal. So the, when you match those serum levels, it does not make much of a difference from the bioavailability perspective. And it is, you know, in line with those, you know, serum level uh, making. So that is, that is one, I would say. So I would not say that it is superior, but also not inferior. We can, you know, keep them in the same level. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Excellent, uh, Dr. Patel. So I think we are in tandem, you know, whether it's an academician or a private practicing dietitian or somebody from a government setup or a private setup, um, all the stakeholders are on the same page, what we need to do. Uh, there are policies in place. Uh, what, what is required is that it reaches the masses. It reaches the people who actually need this nutrition support. So through public and you know, private partnerships across different industries, uh, stakeholders, government stakeholders, let us try and kind of pledge that we truly move towards a Suposhit Bharat. Uh, with, on that positive note, I think uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for your time. Um, and you know, in spite of all the technical glitches, et cetera, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Uh, please be with us. We have some exciting prize distribution to be shared. May I request all the panelists to quickly switch on the cameras uh, so that we can take a picture. And then we'll move on to the next section, which is our prize distribution. Okay. Will you please enable my video? Yes, ma'am. Megha, can you do that, please? Done, ma'am. Yeah, thanks. Um, we're missing Eileen, ma'am. Uh, Eileen, ma'am, can you switch on the video, please? I'm, I'm trying, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, ma'am, you can try now. Mr. Kaushik, are you there? If you can switch on your camera. Yeah, good.
I'll quickly take a picture. Ruby, can you quickly start your camera as well? Because you are doing the next section of prize distribution. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Jayashree, Jayashree. We lost somebody. We have not seen Jayashree. Yeah, Jayashree. Um, you just click on my dad's slides because I'm traveling. No problem. No problem. No problem. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So over to you, Ruby, for the next section of price distribution. So we'll switch off cameras. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Very good evening to one and all. I'm so glad to see people from different backgrounds discussing on this important issue of uh, malnutrition. Uh, firstly, I want to thank for such a great discussion because what we discuss at large is uh, about the portion the from your academic, your research view. But like we said, this year, the theme is portion view or padhai bhi. So padhai and education is equally important. So considering two facts, one, those students who are in the, who are still studying in, and learning about malnutrition, how they can take it forward, plus how we can use this education as a tool to go forward in the community and translate this into uh, realities by doing some, uh, you know, creating recipes that will help them, which are very low in cost, which are very easy to cook so that, you know, we can use uh, these recipes to educate them so that they can use to combat malnutrition and also use certain posters and slides which can translate our, uh, you know, our... Uh, uh, what we want to achieve into a simpler, easier language in a pictorial format for them to understand. So for this, to accomplish this, we actually conducted a couple of um, intercollegiate competitions, not only with the uh, students of the colleges, but also among the working dietitians. And I think this is a very important part of the program. Otherwise, it would have been an in incomplete education on malnutrition. And we are very glad that, you know, we've got amazing uh, uh, recipes. So what we did uh, is ask for videos of these recipes so that we can get from different parts of the country and different colleges. And we also did an e-poster competition. We got we were overwhelming response in both the categories. And among the video recipes, uh, myself, Dr. Sama, Sana from, sorry, Dr. Shama from uh, Nanavati College and uh, Ms. Prema Saldana from the Hadsa. We evaluated these recipes and we picked up the three recipes, which are best in terms of uh, the nutrition value, in terms of the um, low in cost, in terms of the uh, easy and accessibility, which can be used in different, all different uh, socioeconomic groups. Uh, when we looked at the e-posters, they were all in digital format, which was assessed by none other than Dr. Eileen and Ms. Neeti Desai. And we've shortlisted the winners and they're going to get exciting prizes, uh, great vouchers coming up their way. So it's time to, you know, raise the curtain and see who the winners are. I'm sure some of the participants are there. So I request the Megha to first show me the slide of the winners. And I'm sure they're all waiting. All the recipes were excellent. But this is the final list of prizes. The first prize goes to Ms. Pankti Gala, who very innovatively used barley to make these creative balls, which is a snack food, a finger food, which is easy. And I'm sure almost all age groups would love it. Very economical. barley which usually we don't know how to use in a recipe. Very, very excellent way of using barley. Thank you so much. And these don't, they look fried, but they are not fried. They are used uh, for dry roasting or using, uh, she's made it in the pump pan, it seems. So it is an excellent way, a low calorie. The second prize goes to Miss Supriya Gosavi. Uh, you cannot make out the from the picture that this is made out of jawar. So you, she used jawar as a base for creating noodles. Very, very innovative. And I'm sure this is tasty as well. Thank you, Supriya, for coming up with such an idea. And last but not the least, the third prize goes to Mishri Modi, who made a very sweet delight, which is a bajra smoothie. Very rarely can say someone think of bajra to be a part of the smoothie. So well done, all of you. You had come up with great ideas. We can share your recipes for every with everyone. And uh, looking forward to tasting these recipes if possible sometime. Thank you so much. Excellent. So congratulating once again the recipe winners. And now let's move on to the other category, which was the poster category. Excellent ideas on the innovative strategies to fight malnutrition. Ms. Divya Veera gets the first prize. Congratulations, Divya. Shambhavi Kamar 
gets a second prize and Merlin Measurance gets third prize. Excellent. I think we will be able to show the posters as well uh, for all these three winners. Uh, can we see the posters, Mega? Yeah, this is the first uh, winner's poster with Divya Alvira. Uh, the next one is one by Shambhavi Kamar. Mega, if you can show that poster. Very simple pictures, very uh, clear messages coming from this, which also includes all the points that we discussed about kitchen gardening, how to prevent it, how education can be used to avoid junk food. Very good work. And third winner, Madeline. We'll see her poster as well. Again, a very uh, good uh, poster, which clearly talks about labeling and, uh, uh, of course, also about the breastfeeding. So, excellent work. We can use this education as a tool to somewhere come out about malnutrition. Somewhere. So, I thank um, everybody for sending the entry. Everybody is a winner, but heartiest congratulations from Hatsa and IDA Mumbai chapter to all these winners. The prize is just your way. Very shortly, you will see or soon receive all the vouchers. Great. So now this takes me to the last bit of the today's we'll program. Also announce the program as well. So we notification. So let me do that first before I give a vote of thanks. So we continue this journey of uh, malnutrition uh, prevention and uh, education. Uh, as we discussed, portion um, and padhai. Padhai ka to humne dekh liya. Ata forty five kaise karay sa ports la te apn udya shikuya. Udya Sandhya Kali, that is tomorrow, 21st of September, Wednesday, we have a session between 4 and 5, where we'll be doing a panel discussion on this area specifically. And this is a program for tomorrow, where we have uh, representatives from different corporate sectors, from industry, and also from uh, uh, PFNDI. I look forward for tomorrow's um, program, and I'm sure we have great attendance tomorrow. So please join us tomorrow. Uh, at four o'clock, the link will be sent to everybody once again tomorrow morning. So then we complete the whole cascade of Pasha, portion and Padai put together. In fact, before uh, going towards the last uh, vote of thanks, we also are going to continue this uh, mohim of educating and bringing this to the masses. So luckily now we are out of the lockdown era and we look forward to go to the masses here onwards, go to the schools, whether it's socioeconomically low group or uh, to you know, uh, medium income group schools, or to NGOs, or to areas, communities like Dharavi where malnutrition is very bad. So we also invite everyone to support us in this mohim, and we will go in the community and spread the awareness. So we will start uh, doing some programs in the schools henceforth, and we will keep you all updated. And everybody is uh, welcome to join this mohim with us. Uh, and I look forward everyone to begin this tomorrow itself in the evening program tomorrow. So I think we, uh, I have covered most of the points uh, and I will now give a formal vote of thanks to everyone. I firstly want to thank uh, Dr. Nuram Adam Mitra, ma'am. Um, you've given a real great perspective of overall on malnutrition and the latest statistics also, which tells us where we really stand. Thank you so much for such an elucidative, elaborate uh, presentation, ma'am. Thank you so much. And uh, I then want to thank all the panelists who made it very interesting and spoke all the practical challenges, um, whether it is from corporate uh, or from private sector or from, uh, you know, government setup as well. So I thank Jayshri Paranjpe, ma'am. I thank you, Dr. Eileen Kande, Dr. Alka Jadav, Ms. Neeti Desai, ma'am, and Dr. Priestesh Patel. Thank you all for giving your valuable input. It makes a big difference. And I think this is all possible because... Uh, my dear friend Sukhda Bhatte and Anaga Palikar, they conducted the panel very, very well. Thank you so much, Sukhda and Anaga. Thank you, Rudy. I want to take this opportunity to thank you as well for being a constant support. Um, let me also take this opportunity to thank Abbott Nutrition for supporting this program today and also supporting the prizes for the prize winners as well. So thank you so much, Team Abbott Nutrition as well. And this was not possible without the back-end support, which is uh, given by Megha Tehse and Shraddha Vision. In spite of the busy schedule, they were throughout this program and they're still handling at the back-end. Thank you so much, girls. And last but not the least, our supporting uh, association, which is Hatsa. And this wouldn't have been possible without uh, the consensus and uh, joint support by, from Dr. Vaibhav Kulkarni and Mr. Kaushik Desai. Once again, we thank you. And we look forward for the support in the near future also. So with these last words, I will uh, 
see you and uh, i thank everybody from the bottom of heart to each and everyone attending thank you so much panelists we have more than uh, almost 100 participants throughout and i think uh, each one of us can make a big difference to the society thank you everybody thank you ruby thank you all of you sukada anaga eileen thank you ma'am thank you everyone the members yeah thank you, thank you. mega you can uh, stop the meeting